I thought we didn't have this ring one for. Uh... The... Oh wait, we did. Never mind. Okay, take two. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Tales of the Uncharted Territories. Territories. I'm having, just having a little sip there. Never mind, never mind. Hello, it's uh, it's your friends, Kaki and Kay, and we're here back once again with some Farscape, well, not fan fiction this time. No, this is official, I suppose. Yes, officially licensed Farscape fiction from Farscape magazine number two. Yes, a new latest season three, free poster, DVDs and DVD player. You can win. Claudia Black on the run. What's next for Farscape? Producer David Kemper speaks. <laughs> okay, uh, I thought you were going to introduce the title of the story, which oh. is Brotherly Love. But well, no, I, I, was, I, was, I was just talking about this wonderful magazine, which was... Uh, a gift from gift- Matatron, one yes. of our uh, beloved listeners. Thank you so much. But yes, today's story is called A Brotherly Love, and it's got a very uh, uh, dashing picture of uh, Crace on the yes. fr- first page. I think that's his uh, his first season uniform. It has the it has the red trim with the sort of leather blaze across the front. He's in one of his more stable periods, yes. judging by his hair. Yes, although there's some serious photoshopping going on here because if you look at his ear, there's something definitely weird with the shadows happening there. Oh. Yes. I think he was maybe cropped a bit straight. So that's yes, possible. I think so. And we have more pictures of him and John and Moya and Trace's uh, assistant here when she was still oh, alive. Oh, Lieutenant Teague of Blessed yeah. Memory. Oh, whoa. I'm uh, very curious about this story. I'm just quickly leafing through the pages here to see what everything looks like. But yes, shall we get going? Yes. All right. Kick off. Talon screamed. The attack by the five alien ships was a total surprise. Though they came in with a classic hit-and-run tactic, Talon had been able to destroy two of them before they could retreat. I was just thinking, in a recent episode, Grace called it strike-and-retreat tactics. I think so, yes. Right, so instead of hit-and-run. But then the effects of the alien's strange weapon began to manifest. The energy levels of the young biomechanoid gunship started to drop. His screams grew louder inside Bialar Crace's head. Oh, no! Crace had no idea who these aliens were, nor why they attacked Talon. He attempted to communicate with them to no avail. That was the problem with living on the run in the uncharted territories. While it kept him free of the peacekeepers who were surely hunting him, it also meant running the risk of encountering dangerous, unclassified alien life forms. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so peacekeeper territory must be heavily regulated and you Mm. don't encounter... Okay. Pain shot through Grace's body and he stumbled to the deck. The pain Talon was feeling was transmitted to Grace through his neural link they shared. Starburst Talon, now! He managed to shout. It had been arrogant, he knew. Talon was a formidable... Uh, as formidable a warship as Crace had ever seen in his long military career. Yeah. But he also knew that the first rule of space travel was that there was always someone bigger. Whoever these aliens were with their strange weaponry that seemed to take the very life from the Leviathan, they definitely had the better of Talon. In over a cycle of life, Talon had never lost a fight before, and the child seemed befuddled by the very idea, even as he continued to scream in pain. Whoa. Okay, where do we place this then? Because this must then be after, I guess, the... Oh, what were the the Skeksis? What were they called again? Right. Or bef- uh, Imagine me not knowing that. Isn't, yes. Colossians. Colossians, yes. I, wasn't there... It could have been the story where they were... Oh, no, they were attacked by the Peacekeeper uh, uh, Recovery Squad, but that's different. Yeah, the Retrieval Squad. Ooh, yeah. okay. Ha-da-da-da-da. No doubt, Grace thought bitterly. Talon learned that arrogance from me. That same arrogance had forced him to keep after Talon's mother, Moya, and the prisoners she carried, even after he had ordered... He, he had been ordered to return. Ah, yeah. That same arrogance that fueled his desire for revenge against John Crichton for killing his brother, Tauvo. Ooh. That had always been his downfall. Ironically, it had been Tauvo who had kept him centred, reminded him of his limitations. Tauvo. Crace could feel Talon's energy levels dropping with each passing microt. If we don't starburst now, these aliens will have our mivonks in a vice. Talon, you must starburst now! Who, uh, no, we don't need the... Okay, no. yeah. There's a, there's a little insert there. Unfortunately, the, the weapon had done its job well. Talon, in truth, did not have enough energy left to even return fire, never mind starburst properly. No, Chris thought. I will not allow myself to be defeated. He looked at the viewport. The three remaining alien craft were moving in for what sh- was surely the killing blow. If Talon did not starburst now, they were dead. Talon will be dead, and I will have failed him, as I failed Tauvo. 
the aliens closed in. Ooh. Oh, now, scene change here. They had been playing a game of Tadek when Father summoned them. Tauvo had asked a question about the strategy of the game and Byla was patiently explaining it to him, showing him strategies that had been established hundreds of cycles earlier by masters of the game. I'm imagining Talvo just whacking his little mallet on the sort of cyber thing like like Rigel does, because that's the game he's playing. Bing, bing, bing. I'm bored, bored, bored. Talvo always had questions about everything, and Bailar had seen it as his duty, as the older brother, to make sure those questions were answered. Certainly, Father was unlikely to provide them. Talvo had learned early on that the only response he'd get to questions to Father was another question. Why are you pestering me when you could be doing your chores? Still, Father's summons was to be obeyed instantly, so they stopped the game and went immediately to see him. The recruiter is here to pick you up, he said, when they ran up to him and stood at attention. It's time for you to go. Go? Talvo asked, confused. It fell to Bailar like a gree worm had taken root in his stomach. His father had told him that this day would come, that one day the peacekeepers would come to take him and Talvo away to serve. He had hoped that it was a lie, a game Father was playing. But in his heart he knew better. Father never played games. He left that to his sons. Father looked at Bailar, and for the first time Bailar could remember, Father looked old. I'm counting on you to protect him, he said, indicating Talvo. Do you understand? I understand all too well, Father, Bailar thought. Sorry, I'm going to make him into Mopey Teen. (laughs) I understand all too well, Father, Bailar thought, but was too dutiful to say it out loud. You are letting them destroy our family. Bailar! Father grabbed him by the shoulders. Do you understand? I don't understand. No, I'm going to make him into a sort of little orphan child. I don't understand, Father, Talvo said, his voice cracking. Where are they taking us? A tear streaked down Talvo's smooth face. We're going on on an adventure, Bailar finally said. Hold on, hold on. uh, Another scene change. Yep, yep, yep. Shall I take this? uh... Uh, No, I've got it, I've got it. Talvo Kreis reporting for duty, sir. The voice was solemn and dutiful, no different from any other officer reporting to a superior. The form that spoke, saluted, and bowed in the proper peacekeeper manner. Then the grin exploded onto his face, and Captain Bailar Crace knew that his brother hadn't changed so much as he had feared. Captain's bar suit you, brother. Crace rarely allowed himself to smile when on duty, but he could hardly help himself. They will suit you as well some day, brother. Tarfo made a snorting noise. Not likely. It's a pilot duty for me. Ordering people around is your lookout, not mine. Never could stomach it. Just point me at something and let me go, and I'm fine. He took a seat in Crace's spacious office at the heart of his command carrier. So, how did I get unlucky enough to get assigned to you? Luck is irrelevant, Bailar lied. I had an opening for a prowler pilot, and your name was next up on the transfer roster. The truth was, he had pulled several strings to get Talvo assigned to his command carrier. Most had viewed it as an eccentricity. After all, accidents of birth were inadequate reasons for sentiment, as most of his fellow peacekeepers would insist. But while the peacekeepers discouraged family ties, Bailar Crace had never forgotten his father's last words to him. And how better to protect you, brother, than to have you in my crew? It had taken Crace many years of success to get to the point where he would be allowed such an indulgence as transferring his brother to his command. Bailar Kreis had clawed his way up the ranks and attained an exalted rank generally beyond that of draftees. Ooh. So if he wanted his brother to be his new prowler pilot, High Command would not view it as odd, especially since Tauvo had more than distinguished himself. Even if he was not Kreis's brother, he might as well requested him. Hmm. After pouring some raslak into a pair of glasses, Kreis handed one to his brother. A toast. Again, Tavo snorted. He seemed to do that more in his adulthood than he ever had when they were children, or when they went through training together. Should we be doing this on duty, Captain? <laughs> Commander's privilege, he said with another smile, raising the glass. To the sons of Chris. Tavo also raised his glass, then drank from it. So, he said, after swallowing the amber liquid, what's my first duty? Chris drained his own glass, then pulled up the Prowler duty roster. I humbly request permission to take my command carrier into the uncharted territories. The Admiral regarded Crace with a dubious, as dubious an expression as he was capable of with only one eye. Crace had always found the Admiral's use of an eye patch to be an absurd affectation. Yes. It, it wasn't as if prosthetics weren't readily available, especially to one of the highest ranking peacekeepers. But the Admiral obviously felt that the patch of leather over his left eye added to his ability to intimidate the lower ranks, not to mention his fellow Admirals. And perhaps... It does for those of lesser character, Crace thought disdainfully. 
Yay, yay. This was the message that he received, the video message yes. that he received where he was called back from, was from an admiral with an eye patch. It must be the same guy. Mm. Good job. Yes. Is that the, yeah. New page. Yep. Uh, no, I'm on the new page. I'm oh. just trying to figure out who Sorry. the, Yes. You believe that retrieving these escaped prisoners, one contaminated officer and one leviathan is worth leaving peacekeeper jurisdiction, Captain? No, he thought with a fury unlike anything he'd ever felt. I believe avenging my brother's murder by some pound car of an alien is worth any price. Yeah. But Bylar Kreis had been trained well enough to know that such was not the way to approach high command. The leviathan reproduction project is at a critical stage, Admiral. In addition, the pilot for this leviathan is new and untested. It would be dangerous to allow it to be unduly influenced by these prisoners, particularly since one of them is a Hynerian royal. You know how devious they can be. The Admiral chuckled. Mostly from reports of your own exploits, Captain. <laughs> Still, despite some of the setbacks you've had, the Leviathan breeding project is indeed too important to lose. If this Moya is part of that, then yes, you will need to retrieve her. The Admiral pressed several buttons on the console in front of him. I hereby authorize you to traverse the uncharted territories, Captain, with the proviso that you remain there only for the time it takes you to retrieve the Leviathan and, if possible, its prisoners and the contaminated officer. The Admiral leaned forward, favoring the side with the eye patch in an attempt to look more menacing. <coughs> but proceed with dispatch, Captain. This is a simple retrieval mission. Not as simple as all that, I'm afraid, Admiral. Remember... Leviathan can starburst. Crace regetted the words the moment he spoke them, telling an admiral something he already knew, or at least already should know, was ill-advised. I'm fully aware of the tactical specifications of a Leviathan, Captain. Kindly get on with your mission. Without another word, the admiral signed off, his face disappearing from the hollow projector in Crace's office. The same office where he and Tauvo had shared that Raslak not so long ago. I promised to protect you, Tauvo, he thought. And instead, you wind up dead. You will be avenged. He opened a communication channel to, to the command. Lieutenant Teague, set course after the Leviathan. Into the uncharted territories, came Teague's voice over the speakers. Grace noted that the lieutenant had carefully phrased the inquiry as confirming the orders, not questioning them. <laughs> we are authorised to proceed into the uncharted territories in order to retrieve the prisoners and the Leviathan. Best speed, Lieutenant. <sighs> this is riveting, by mm. the way. I know we're just completely losing ourselves in this, but in the meantime, like, this is... We've never spent this much time with, with Crace. Like, no. By now we've had Incubator, so we've had a day in the life of, uh, uh, Scorpius. of Scorpius. Yes. But not, like, what's life like for Crace on Talon with just nobody else to talk to? No. Well, this is not on Talon. This is all flashback to... Uh... Yeah. Oh, yeah, I sort of thought that maybe he was flashing back to this while he was there. But yes, you're right, this is yeah. sort of cutting back and forth. Okay. Riveting, in any case. Lieutenant Teague lay dead at Crace's feet. Oh, for many cycles, she had served faithfully by Crace's side, coming up with him from the lower ranks, always dedicated, always loyal. Bylar Crace had snapped her neck without a second thought. The Admiral's orders were simple and straightforward. Return to First Command and explain why a retrieval mission that shouldn't have taken more than a few solar days had now been going on for half a cycle. Oh. Only Teague and Kreis had seen the orders. The simplest, most effective way to keep the rest of the crew from knowing about those orders was to kill Teague, then order his carrier deeper into the Uncharteds. He had Crichton in his hands. In his hands! And still he was not able to kill him. The human had once again slipped through his grasp thanks to that far but madman Maldis. Crace called up the image of Talvo. Today had been the anniversary of his birth. He remembered the day Talvo was born as if it was yesterday, almost as clearly as he remembered the day they were drafted into the peacekeepers. I'm counting on you to protect him, father had said. And the human Crichton, a member of a pathetic inferior species, had killed him. Crace could not forgive that sin, and so committed more of them. Nothing mattered. Not the Admiral's orders, not Teague's life and loyalty, not the Leviathan breathing project, not the fuel consumption reports that he had been routinely ignoring for the last several solar days despite Lieutenant Bracca's best efforts. All that mattered was avenging Tavo's death. It would have been fitting to end this quest today of all days. Instead, it simply went on for another solar day. And another. And another. And it would continue until John Crichton lay dead at Bailar Crace's feet. No! Crace woke up screaming again. Talon immediately queried him as to what was wrong, just that he had every other time that he'd had a nightmare in the last four solar days. Whoa. This time, though, he'd only been in sleep for an iron. I'm fine, Talon. Simply another nightmare. 
Talon still did not grasp the concept, of course. Crace doubted he ever would. Leviathan was in sleep and therefore did not dream. Besides, Talon was a child, less than half a cycle old, and was still full of questions. In many ways, he reminded Crace of Talvo when he was younger. Since Crace had set himself up as T- Talon's surrogate father, in much the same way he had with Talvo, he made sure always to answer his questions. There are images that come to me when I sleep, Talon. But of course, Talon wanted to know more about wanted to know about these images. People, he said evasively. Sadly, his connection to Talon was too close for the biomechanoid to be so easily put off. Talon could feel how important the people in the dream were to Crace. However, Crace refused to dwell on it. They are people from my past, Talon, from before you and I were bonded. This confused Talon. Like most children, he had very little conception that there was life before he existed. He did not understand how anybody else could be of consequence. This is brilliant. Yeah, you are correct. They are of no consequence. We shall not speak of them again. Have the Holotians returned or brought friends? So it was the Holotians who attacked them. Aha! Well, unless we're... I think we're still sort of cutting through various flashbacks because it was five ships that left him crippled. Yeah. So this must still be before the opening attack. Okay. Right? We're just inching our way up from oh, okay. yes. season one right. through... Right, I see what you mean. Talon had dealt rather harshly with the Holotian ship that had attacked them two solar days ago, but it had not completely destroyed them. Talon had not seen any sign of them since. Very well, I will return to sleep for the nonce. For the nonce? Oh, yes. Wake me if I'm needed, Talon. Crace could feel the young leviathan's concern through their link, but the ship said nothing. Crace went back to sleep, determined that the nightmares would not come back. They would, of course. Talvo's birthday had not been a good day for Bialar Crace the previous cycle. He doubted it would be any better this cycle. He heard Father Summons interrupting the Tadic game. The recruiter is here to pick you up. He watched Talvo burn to a crisp in front of him, yeah. an image provided by Maldis. Set course after the Leviathan. Captain's bars suit you, brother. He watched Talvo's prowler crash into the asteroid after colliding with Crichton's module. Talvo is dead, struck down by a weak, pathetic, inferior being. I'm counting on you to protect him. He heard the crack of Lieutenant Teague's neck. Talvo Crace reporting for duty, sir. We're going on an adventure. He felt the neural link with Talon for the first time, an intimacy he'd never believed possible. Talvo is dead. I'm counting on you to protect him, struck down by a weak, pathetic, inferior being. He took in the magnificence of Talon when he first boarded him, and again when he took him from Moya's side. You cannot take a child from its mother. You forget it was done to me. The recruiter is here to pick you up. And it was done to you. He saw the prowler collide with Crichton's module and crash into the asteroid over and over and over. Again, he woke up screaming. This time, Talon was insistent. He would not take it was nothing for an answer, especially given the cold sweat that now drenched Crace's body. As I told you before, Talon, Crace said slowly, trying to form the words in a way that the ship would understand. The images are people from my past, my father, my former lieutenant, my brother. Talon seemed to be having difficulty with the brother concept. My brother. It would be as if Moya had another offspring like you, Talon. That explains... There. That explanation sufficed, though Talon did not understand why Crace's reaction to that was so much stronger than it was to his father. After all, Talon couldn't imagine feeling closer to another offspring of Moya than to Moya herself. Oh, Crace hesitated. I was the older brother, he finally said. I was the one who took care of Talvo. He was my responsibility, just as you and I are responsible for each other. When he died, I, I was filled with rage. I lashed out at everyone because I failed. It was the first time Byla Crace had come out and admitted his failure out loud. Even when he had bared his soul to Crichton on Moya shortly before he took over Talon, he had not actually said the words. What is worse, I could not admit to myself that I failed Tavo. I hounded Moya, I killed Teague, I threw away my career, almost threw away my life, almost all because I couldn't admit the truth. When Crace did not immediately elaborate, Talon asked what the truth was. That I have been a failure, Crace finally said. I have reneged on all my promises. I promised Father I would protect Talvo. I swore an oath to uphold peacekeeper rules and laws. I swore I would not rest until I killed Crichton. In the Aurora chair, I swore I would kill Officer Sun. Talon reacted badly to that. Aaron Sun had named Talon, and the ship's affection for Alan was second only to his for Moya and for Crace himself. Yes, Talon, it is true. 
but it seems one more oath broken would hardly be noticed. Crace felt kind of warmth over the neural link. Talon did not view Crace as a failure, Aww. nor as an icebreaker. Generally, Talon conveyed his thoughts and feelings to Crace directly through the neural link. However, he deliberately, albeit awkwardly, phrased his next thoughts in words. They are of the past. They are of no consequence. For the first time since Talvo died, Byla Crace smiled. Of course, Talon, you are correct. Thank you. They proceeded on course together. The three alien ships closed in. In another microt, Talon and Crace would be completely at their mercy unless Talon went into Starburst. I may have broken every other oath and promise, but I will not allow Talon to be killed. Talon, use whatever energy you must, even from me, but Starburst now! Suddenly, Crace's legs would not work and Whoa. collapsed to the deck. His vision clouded and he felt weak. As he'd hoped, Talon was using Crace's own life force to gather up the remaining energy necessary to Starburst away from the aliens. Whoa! Crace's screams matched Talon's as the Leviathan went into Starburst. Before he lost consciousness, Crace's thoughts were happy ones. We have escaped Talon. Together. Ooh. This must be the retrieval squad. I guess so, yeah. Right, given the timing in the... Oh, this is fantastic. And the strange weaponry that they were using to, uh, you know, it, yeah, clearly designed to disable mo uh, Leviathans. Yes, the immobilizer pulse. I mean, Aaron seems to recognize it, or does, or maybe Crace identified it after the fact? Probably later, yeah. Because here he didn't seem to uh, know what was going on. Yeah. Oh, I'm really... Crace had no idea who these aliens were. I mean, he just must not have gotten any data. He'd, he'd recognize a peacekeeper ship if he saw one. I suppose so, yeah. So, this story was by uh, Keith R.A. De Candido, who also wrote this short story, Many a Mile to Freedom. Which we've read before on this in, podcast. Yes. As well as another short story for the... Oh, the Farscape role-playing game. Oh, very there, good, yes. You'll have to check that and see if we have another another story in there. Yes. And also the novel... Was Did it did it say a novel? No, uh, he wrote for uh, Star Trek, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Doctor Who, Marvel Comics, Xena, and many, many more. Oh, yes, and the Farscape novel House of Cards. Oh, also. yes. Yep. So, once again, thank you to... Uh, uh, <laughs> Thank you to Keith R.A. DeCandido, and I'm very proud that I hope that I got his name right this time, because that was <laughs> an unfortunate amount of editing that I had to do the last time around. Um, and to our, our, our buddy Matatron for the gift of the magazine. It's, it's full of wonderful, wonderful interviews with very fresh-faced and uh, a tired-sounding production crew. It's marvellous. Mm. So far, this was another episode of Tales of the Uncharted Territories. We'll be back next week with a new episode of Farscape. And until then... Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>